forward to this computer. All right. All right. Um, hello. Hello. <laughs> so um, I'm so excited. I'll tell you a little bit about where I'm my experience with inheritors so far. Um, so you know where I am coming from a little bit about that play. Like you, I love to look at a play that I'm working on in the context of when it was written. Mm -hmm. What did the playwright, what was the playwright experiencing? What was the audience experiencing when they would come see the original production of the show? I think that's so crucial to really understanding some of the nuances of what's happening inside the inside the production. Graham mm -hmm. approached me as part of the uh, Lost Ladies project and said, would you like to work on this show? Um, Inheritors by Susan Glasswell. Being a fan of Susan Glasswell, just from trifles, as many of us are, I'm like, okay, that sounds interesting. He sent me a copy of Inheritors. I was sold halfway through the first scene with grandmother Morton's talking about her relationship with the indigenous people of the place was so forward thinking and just extraordinary. I knew I wanted to really help bring this story and preserve a telling of this story. And it just went on and on throughout the script. Every layer, every scene, every conversation peels back another part of the American experience that a hundred years ago, it's shocking that so many of those things we're still struggling with and talking about now, oh, yes. especially oh, yes. <laughs> coming out of the pandemic and, uh, and some of the social unrest from last year, which speaks directly to some of the things that inheritors. And so the, I, the, immigrant issue, the immigrant issues that we've been grappling with for you know, the last five or so years, yeah? It's amazing. So the way I'm approaching the reading that I'm doing is it's a rehearsed reading. It's an identity blind cast. So I didn't really get focused too much on the age or the identity genders of anybody. It's just the sort of idea of we want to lift this text off of the page and present, um, give some choices to it, give some life to it. As you mentioned in your chapter about inheritors, the critics say it's so long. It's a very long piece. So being able to keep that energy going, and you've also mentioned in your, in your writing about it that audiences loved it, even if critics found themselves distanced from it. But I think that really goes to the strength of Glassbell as a playwright, of knowing mm -hmm. what audiences enjoy when they're in that space. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping to bring some of that energy to really focus on the conflict between the characters. It could be so easy with some of these long speeches just to lean back into the words, but I think finding what they're fighting for, what each person is struggling mm -hmm. with, I think is really gonna bring this piece to life. So that's sort of how I'm approaching it um, and, and what, the, what I've been thinking about um, for performance yeah, with great. it as it's coming up. Um, so great. I'm excited to talk to you about some of the drama dramaturgical aspects of it. The okay. first thing that I wanted to um, uh, bring out is one of the things that you mentioned and you're writing about Glassbell is her, the importance of her, of the unseen characters, the, the, the characters that are absent. Can you talk a little bit about that with inheritors, specifically with the characters that so many in there refer to as the Hindus? Yeah. I honestly don't know whether there are any casting issues there in terms of access to actors that could, if she had wanted, in other words, if she had wanted to write in those characters, would there have been actors to play those? Um, and if we wanna think about this in, in kind of a little bit, stepping back a little bit of a broader context, we have to remember that the Provincetown uh, was one of the first theaters um, to integrate their casts. Um, so uh, there's, you know, a lot of, of uh, sort of history background to, for example, O'Neill's play, The Emperor Jones, right, which cast, uh, they, you know, they went and found uh, an African-American actor 
to play Emperor Jones. And of course, that uh, that play is is quite controversial. Uh, it's an O'Neill play. It's not a Glasgow play. Um, but we have to think about those, you know, as as being kind of neighboring pieces. Um, and I honestly don't know the answer to that. I don't know whether um, that was a strategic choice um, uh, in terms of, you know, if she had brought those characters in, uh, I think she would have been very committed to the idea of uh, uh, of actors of color uh, playing those roles, but I don't know whether we had any pool for that. Um, so it may have been a pragmatic choice. It may have been a more, uh, you know, kind of thematic uh, choice, right? And As Emperor Jones other... and Inheritors were the same season produced in the same season for Provincetown. So, so it's, 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 uh, you know, so we have those, we have those sort of uh, neighboring, you know, concerns, right? Um, so I honestly don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know enough about the, the pool, you know, that would have been available to her. But certainly if we think about this as a recurring uh, dramaturgical technique, right? One that she starts off using in trifles, uses again in her first, three act play called Bernice. Um, and uh, she continues to use all the way into her Pulitzer Prize winning play, Allison's House, which uh, doesn't emerge until 1930. So you see that this is something she is, is continuing to use as a theatrical strategy over uh, quite an extended period of time. So if we, you know, we wanna think about it that way, um, the Hindus, as well as the young man who is the um, incarcerated conscientious objector um, that uh, is also, I think, a very, very important character in Inheritors. Uh, so in other words, the Hindu students are not the only uh, un unseen character that become integral to the, to the story here. And I think that Glasspool does uh, that, um, uses that same device over and over again because it serves, I think it serves her very well uh, in terms of letting her audience imagine and thereby construct uh, an identity. It also happens with other characters within the world of the play. So, you know, you mentioned trifles. Obviously, that's the first time that she does that in a very thoroughgoing way. Her She actually does it in her very first play. Her very first play is called Suppressed Desire. She wrote it with her husband, uh, George Graham Cook. And it's a, a kind of a lighthearted spoof of the um, vogue for Freudian psychology, which was uh, just burgeoning exploding in Greenwich Village at the time. And uh, one of the things that I love about that piece is, is it's the first time she uses that device. And the person who is never seen is the Freudian psychologist. Um, and there's a kind of a beautiful sort of irony and, and you know, comedy to the fact that, you know, Freud and his uh, sort of spokesperson are just kind of hanging over this, uh, looming in the background, right? But we never see them uh, just in the same way that we don't ever see what is going on inside people's heads, right? So it's very kind of um, thematically uh, resonant in that way. Um, so that's really the first time she uses that device theatrically. Um, but in trifles, I think that uh, it works very well uh, because it really underscores this idea that every single character in that play is constructing Minnie Wright, the woman who was accused of murder, and also her husband, who is now deceased, um, uh, who is also being constructed, right? And we get this uh, very clear um, idea, uh, image of how other people come to define, right? Their neighbors, their colleagues, their friends, et cetera. And that is gendered, uh, it's often classed. Um, so she uses it in any number, uh, in any number of ways. Um, I think that in inheritors, 
Um, obviously, the fact that we have this, I'm going to kind of talk about both of them, but this young man who is um, incarcerated uh, for his political views, um, I think one of the most powerful scenes in all of Glasspool's plays is the scene in Inheritors where Madeline Fregeberry gets uh, the letter from this young man who is incarcerated. And he has described uh, what his what it, what it's like being in this cell, and she marks out on the stage what the dimensions of the cell are. And Madeline puts herself in this space. She holds her arms up as his would have been in solitary confinement for that punishment, and so she becomes this other character. And I think that that sense of um, empathic connection with another person who can't be there because he is incarcerated. You know, she absolutely minds this device for just, you know, all that it's worth. And I, and I would say it's so much more powerful to have Madeline do that than it would have been if we'd switch scenes and we saw him in prison or something along those lines. Similarly, with the Hindu students that we never see, it's that notion of the other. And she absolutely understands already, right, this notion of how we other individuals and we uh, project onto them all kinds of ideas about who they are and what they believe in and uh, what they look like and how they behave and all of those sorts of things. And we see um, just with the other characters discussions of these students, the assumptions that get made about their political beliefs. And of course, there's this other uh, white male student who has kind of the rug pulled out from under him, right, because he mistakenly assumes uh, that they've misquoted something or that they have something wrong, that actually he is the one that, you know, is misinformed, right? Um, they understand Lincoln and Lincoln's ideas about democracy perfectly, right? Um, so again, I think that, that uh, if she had had those students come on stage and kind of speak for themselves, it would have had a certain kind of resonance. But the fact that she has other people construct them, uh, that notion of othering that is so profound that we can't even see them because our own ideas about who they are have completely, uh, in a sense, occluded our ability to see who they are in their own right. Yeah. So I think that that's what's going on there. Um, but again, uh, that's, a, you know, a lovely kind of a dramaturgical lit crit uh, uh, explanation for something that could have been really pragmatic and we'll never know. Yeah, I just can't find the <laughs> actors, so I'm not going to write. <laughs> I want to talk more about Horace in just a little bit, that little weasel that I just love to hate as every time I read the script. Um, a couple of things. First, I want to, you, you mentioned several of the things that are issues in the play, and I wrote down a list of just some of the things that she touches on. Prison reform, mental health, public health, class warfare, economic divide, bigotry, racism, corruption, capitalism, higher ed fundraising, academic freedom, academia itself, a uh, pandemic, genetics, these are just a few of the gender relationships, just a few of the things that she touches on uh, throughout Inheritors. I want to ask you first, why is it Inheritors and not the Inheritors, do you think? I think if you use the definitive article, it narrows the view. Um, so it uh, would, I think, perhaps make us um, think we're only talking about one subset, whereas uh, I think she wants us to understand this concept more broadly, um, and not only in terms of, of human beings even, but even uh, in terms of seeds, right? Um, you know, there's uh, um, that notion of, of corn and her, you know, Madeline's uh, father, who's a little bit uh, kind of obsessed, right, about, um, uh, about genetics and that notion of inheritance that is genetic, that is built 
built into the corn crop. So I think if we said the inheritors, I think um, people would perhaps put up blinders um, in terms of the magnitude of the concept of inheritance that simply permeates this play on so many levels and in so many directions. Uh, you, I wanted to come back a little bit to this because you also mentioned uh, trifles, which of course is her most well-known play. And you say in, the, in, in, in your book about uh, Susan Glasspell and reading her in context in American drama, how one act plays are sort of dismissed by the theatrical community as like, oh, they don't really count. They're not produced very much because they're so small. Despite being a Pulitzer Prize winner, her one act play is pretty much the only show of hers that is anthologized. And it feels like the patriarchy says, we need to recognize this American playwright in some way. But if we include this female playwright in just this one act play, perhaps it's like, we, she doesn't really matter. We're just sort of paying lip service to her. Is that unfair, do you think, of me to think about <laughs> for all these anthologists over the past century? Well, as somebody who's also anthologized trifles, I, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I <laughs> it's small. It fits right in there. It can... <laughs> well, you know, it really is a perfect little play. Um, and which is not to say that that her other pieces, uh, uh, you know, don't have their own form of, of you know, perfection. Um, I think it gets anthologized a lot because it's really teachable um, and because it does a, it, it really works incredibly well um, in the classroom, whether that's the playwriting classroom or dramaturgical classroom or acting classroom or history classroom, you know, it works on so many different levels uh, in so many different ways. Um, so I would like to think that, uh, you know, no matter, no matter that I, I, you know, agree, we would love to have, you know, <laughs> glass bowl represented in many more ways. Um, you know, I think that, that, uh, there are some really good reasons um, that are very positive reasons, right, why trifles gets used um, so often. You know, that said, obviously, yes, we would love it if, you know, The Verge or uh, Allison's House or, you know, some of these other pieces um, uh, got a little bit more airplay. Uh, you know, one of the things I say in, in the book um, uh, that that I think, you know, merits uh, remembering um, is that the, the very famous uh, American actor and director, Eva Legallian, uh, really thought Inheritors was an incredibly important play. And and in her memoir, uh, which was called At 33, um, uh, she, uh, she said she thought that every single American school child should be required to read Inheritor. She felt it was that important uh, as a, a play, as a, um, uh, you know, just a, an example, not only from a literary standpoint, but of course, for all of those um, uh, larger uh, socio-political reasons that you've just listed, um, you know, she felt that it was uh, an incredibly important uh, piece. And, and I feel it's the most important piece uh, politically that Glassbill wrote. Um, I think she has other pieces like The Verge um, that are incredibly important uh, stylistically in terms of really um, demonstrating uh, uh, American theater's engagement with uh, expressionism and, and other advances that we might consider, you know, the avant-garde or the modern. Um, but uh, um, so anyway, I'm going to I'm going to look on the bright side with trifles rather than uh, take the uh, the, you know, the sort of the, the darker view or the more pessimistic view. Um, but I will certainly say that that Glassbill scholarship or Glassbill scholars, I think, writ large are uh, uh, pretty much in agreement that, you know, it would be great if we could kind of, you know, not put trifles on the back burner exactly, but, you know, really give some more uh, uh, under it's some more attention to these uh, works that are undeservedly uh, uh, perhaps uh, ignored or or uh, backburnered shall we say yeah <laughs> I felt I felt embarrassed for myself as someone who spent so long in the world of theater and with a with a, you know studying theater for my bachelor's degree never having encountered inheritors before it was just a, a shock to me personally that this was my interest and so so glad that I encountered it. Um, I, I, so I wanted to ask a little bit, we both work in higher ed 
And I think along with perhaps shows like Oleana or um, Spinning into Butter, that Inheritors also has some really, really relevant things to say about higher ed and academic mm -hmm. freedom. And what's it like? What is the purpose of a college? And that Morton College in the play is a co-educational college back in the early 20th century. And Silas Express, he says so many times, I didn't go to school. And his grandmother was like, you went to school for two years. And he's like, yes, OK, I went to school. But he didn't, he didn't complete. He didn't feel like it was, he didn't get the most out of it. And he wanted to give higher education. What's it like for you as someone in academia who works in higher education to look at this play? Does she have an accurate reflection of what higher ed is like? Well, I think we have to think about this historically. Uh, you know, this is a play that dates from, you know, we don't know exactly when she wrote it, but let's say, you know, somewhere 1919, 1920-ish, uh, you know, she's, she's drafting this. Uh, you know, I, I, I am not an expert on uh, the history of American higher education to a, a level of nuance that would be able to 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 capture this. One of the things I do talk about that that is pretty well documented um, is, the, as you put it out, the suppression of free speech. And we know that during uh, the, the period of the second, uh, the, the First World War, um, that uh, any number of academics uh, were uh, either uh, uh, fired or threatened with uh, uh, prosecution under this same umbrella of the Espionage and Sedition Act. So, so free speech, um, which is certainly something that we uh, privilege in the academy, was very much at risk um, during, you know, the, the period uh, uh, in question. Um, and, and and continued uh, to a little bit uh, to some extent um, afterwards. You know, my my I'm getting off topic a little bit, but my favorite, absolutely favorite uh, sort of anecdote about this play is the one that um, Kenneth McGowan talks about in the review that he wrote of it for Vanity Fair. And I don't know if you remember that that little detail, but. Apparently, um, uh, what happened that we don't know how, but uh, somebody had tipped off uh, the US Marshals to the effect that uh, there was some real controversial content in this play. And even though strictly speaking, the Espionage and Sedition Acts were no longer being actively uh, pursued, we know that there was still, you know, some stuff going on around there. And so however uh, the government got tipped off, they sent a U.S. Marshal to the opening of Inheritors. And Kenneth McGowan obviously saw this dude <laughs> there. And of course, this first act that you were talking about that set, you know, in the 1800s with grandma and, you know, these old dudes and, you know, it seems pretty innocuous. And so apparently the U.S. Marshal kind of, you know, sat through most of this first act and then just said, hey, you know, that that information must have been bad. I'm out of here. I'm not going to sit through the rest of this. So the guy leaves. And of course, the incendiary content <laughs> then comes up later. But, you know, and we can, yes, we can laugh about, you know, laugh about this. But of course, as I think McGowan is pointing out, you know, if this guy had stuck around, there really could have been very serious consequences. I mean, you know, uh, we know that, um, for example, Anthony Comstock got shows, you know, that under the Comstock Act, you know, shows got shut down. Um, the, the entire cast of Bernard Shaw's Mrs. Warren's Profession was arrested um, because of uh, the content of that piece, which is about a woman who very successfully runs a brothel. Um, um, and, uh, uh, you know, the, these kinds of things were going on. So the theater was censored. There was not necessarily really free speech as we, you know, think about it in terms of what was allowed uh, on, uh, uh, on Broadway stages at the time. So, or downtown uh, for that matter, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we know, you know, that that is part of this uh, uh, context. Um, you know, uh, in terms of other things that um, uh, are uh, sort of snapshots of higher ed, um, 
obviously uh, male professors. We don't see any female professors, um, even though there were some. Uh, they were pretty few and far between at that point. Um, Glasswell writes a couple of novels that also have higher ed settings, um, and we always have kind of, you know, hair professor uh, who holds forth. Um, so, you know, in certain ways, she is accurately representing, you know, the tenor of the time uh, in, in that regard. Um, but I also think that her uh, thrall to higher education is, is also very much because of her husband. Um, George Graham Cook um, was uh, uh, himself spent a little bit of time as a professor. Um, I think he revered higher education and what uh, it made possible. Um, philosophically, uh, he was uh, quite elitist um, in terms of, of uh, uh, kind of uh, a devotion to classical literature, classical language, classical philosophy. These were the, the things that uh, um, he believed very strongly in. Um, and I think that kind of rubbed off on her. Um, so I think when we see the representation of higher education in certain ways, we're seeing that through uh, a lens of, uh, of George Graham Cook, Jude Cook, um, uh, perhaps even more than, than Glasspool herself. Glasspool, of course, went to college. She graduated from college. She even did a little graduate work uh, at the University of Chicago. But I think that the, the sort of the reverence for higher education, the real um, uh, sense of possibility uh, that comes from being an educated individual um, is a concept that she got from Cook. And since we're talking a little bit about that couple, the power couple of the Providence Town players, they started this theater company <laughs> together. They brought some friends together because they wanted to tell some stories that they weren't hearing. They crafted some things, they acted in the things themselves. Uh, is it inspiring to you to see these, these thinkers and creators bringing these stories to the stage when nobody else would? Oh, absolutely. And of course, that's still going on, right? Um, you know, uh, I don't know about, uh, you know, in your backyard, but, you know, I, I think about even our, our students, you know, today, and so many of them sort of go off and they want to start their own little theater companies. And, you know, this is great, right? We want them to do that. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, for, I think for, for the, the Provincetown groups, um, it was a, a, a sort of a combination of things that they, you know, weren't seeing, right? They weren't seeing America being represented. They weren't seeing aesthetically things being represented. They weren't seeing the kinds of stories um, being told that they thought were the stories of their lives, right? And it was very, very insular in certain ways, right? It was very, you know, very sort of inward looking as well as outward looking. It got more outward looking as they went along. But initially, they really were just writing about themselves, right, and their community and their friends and the things that they observed going on. And so there was a certain kind of um, circularity or, uh, uh, as I said, kind of reflexivity. You know, they saw stuff, they, they dramatized it, and other people then watched them dramatizing themselves and other people, right? So, you know, it's all kind of within their own little circle. Um, but uh, but that, as I said, that expanded, you know, that expanded out. But, but but uh, I think we want to see it in that context of kind of, you know, American uh, uh, enterprise, right? They just wanted to do their own thing. And of course, we've seen that happen theatrically and as well as in many other ways over and over and over again, right? I, I think when we look at this um, moment, this sort of the rise of the little theater movement, right? And it's not just the Provincetown Players, it's any number of companies all across the United States. Um, that energy, that uh, sense of creating something that really speaks to the moment, um, we see that replicated in the rise of Off-Off-Broadway in the late 1950s and 19, early 1960s, right? And it's happening in exactly the same place. The Greenwich Village, you know, <laughs> arena, again, is, you know, the place where young artists uh, who have ideas, right, who want to use the theater to speak to what is of concern to them, you know, they do it again, right? Um, so uh, uh, I think we we see this this moment in the early 20th century as a, a moment that then is echoed again and again and again, right across uh, uh, time since then. So. Was inheritors um, 
do you think that Glassville was like, we're going to save the world? Or is it, as Shakespeare said, just holding a mirror up to nature? <laughs> um, I think Glassville really did believe in the power of theater to affect meaningful social change. I really do. I think she and her colleagues um, wanted to make things different, wanted to make things better. Um, and I think, remember the early 20th century, you know, we did, <laughs> you mentioned Shakespeare, but of course, you know, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have television, we didn't, you know, there's so many things we didn't have, right? And, um, uh, and theater was a place where people came together and watched stories being told and could leave the theater uh, galvanized, right, energized uh, to uh, to uh, to move out into the world and and have that resonate in in other ways. Um, and we know um, we know that this worked, right? We there are my favorite example actually of this is not uh, uh, an American example; it's a British example, but I'll just uh, share it because um, it's from basically the same sort of moment. Um, so um, one of the uh, uh, kind of uh, alternative playwrights, we'll call them, you know, non-West End playwrights in England at the time, uh, John Galsworthy, who's actually better known as a novelist, but you know, he was also a playwright. Um, and he wrote a play about, well, it, it connects with Inheritors because he wrote a play uh, that was a, a very scathing critique of solitary confinement called Justice. And um, a young Winston Churchill uh, was encouraged to go and see the play. He was not yet, of course, who he became, but he was already working in the British government. And he was so, so the story goes, he was so uh, uh, profoundly moved by the representation of the horrors of solitary con confinement in England at the time that he introduced legislation that led to reform. So it actually brought about meaningful change. Um, and so I always tell my students that story um, because it really, proves you know that theater matters right that that you know that uh the the in-person live communal witnessing of these kinds of narratives can have that kind of profound effect that leads directly to action um it, that's not obviously the only example we have historically, but that's one of my favorites. Um, and, and and I think that that uh, you know Glassbull and her colleagues uh, were aware of the this potential um, because she's not the only one who writes you know very uh, politically engaged pieces. John Reed is writing politically engaged pieces. Other folks are writing politically engaged pieces um, uh, that the Provincetown is doing because I think they felt like their bohemian community uh, of writers and artists and uh, various intellectuals, uh, those folks, it, it was kind of like a, you know, sort of, uh, I don't know, not exactly a domino effect, but, you know, they would create this art and it would resonate out and um, things could things could be better, could be different uh, because of that. I mean, I think all the folks who worked on the masses, right, the newspaper, um, in the village at the time that's very left very left leaning and there was a lot of synergy a lot of overlap between the membership in the province town and the the staff of the masses and you know those folks absolutely believed that their journalistic efforts um could really make a difference and in in instances did um so you know i think that that uh kind of idea about the power of art the power of literature the power of journalism um that pervaded that greenwich village um atmosphere at least at that time <laughs> uh, i want to talk um with you a little bit some specific characters so we mentioned horace which who is a mm -hmm. student at morton college um is he more than just sort of a weaselly character? Does he have a symbolic reference in the play, do you think? I don't know if he has a symbolic reference. I mean, he's <laughs> he's more than a weaselly character. I mean, he he represents a perspective, right? And um 
uh, I was actually just, you know, coincidental. I was um, uh, reading one of my graduate students' uh, dissertation chapters this morning. She's writing a chapter on um, Anna Devere Smith. And, you know, one of the things that I think uh, is very powerful about what Anna Devere Smith does in her pieces is she juxtaposes um, very different viewpoints, right? And she does them in a very, um, truthful thoroughgoing way you know she isn't uh um she doesn't introduce a voice uh as as kind of just a, a straw man right she introduces it to have a certain kind of agency and cogency within the larger world of the play um i don't think glasswell is quite uh that um balanced perhaps <laughs> but um uh, you know, the senator, right, I think is really the kind of the mouthpiece for, you know, well, I mean, this 100% Americanism, you know, thing that he, uh, that he trumpets, right. Um, but of course, you know, if we want to think about the relevance, right, of the pieces, you know, are some of the talking heads that, you know, we heard um, uh, over the last couple of years, you know, do they really sound that different from the senator then? I don't think so, right? There's a certain kind of public discourse that indeed is captured, you know, pretty faithfully, right, <laughs> in that piece. And it still, you know, it still sounds kind of the same, right? Um, so I think that that um, Horace is, you know, yes, is a mouthpiece, right, for certain kinds of, of views, um, but he's more than just a stereotype, right? Um, I think that that in that context of education, right, uh, I think that Glaspell is already uh, uh, sending up some warning signals about um, uh, a kind of facile education, a certain kind of um, uh, danger uh, within education that if we don't protect free speech, if we don't expose our students to uh, the cogency of uh, a wide number of views, we may end up with, uh, you know, folks who are just spouting a certain kind of narrow, less informed ideological perspective. Um, so, uh, you know, at the same time that Horace is, yeah, he's a jerk, and, you know, <laughs> all of that, right? I think that if we unpack his character, we see that that even though, you know, in certain ways he's there very briefly, in certain ways he seems, you know, very kind of cal you know, cal a calculated um, thing, but, but what he represents is very uh, important and actually quite complex, right? What about Doris and Fussy? Is it the same for those? Are they different co-eds than so. just a, a balance of Madeline, or do you think they have a that same sort of role as yeah. Doris? Yeah, and obviously, you know, these are snapshots, right? Yeah. I mean, they just they come in, they have their brief little scene, and then you know, and then they they go, right? So they're clearly, um, you know. Uh, part of the background, right? But I think that they serve those purposes. They serve those purposes uh, that are parallel to Horace's um, in terms of, you know, what do we go to, what do we go to college for? I mean, I don't know uh, about when you went to college, but, but certainly, um, you know, there was the cliche, even when I was an undergraduate that I thought was kind of old fashioned, but perhaps still true, right? That you went to college to get your MRS, right? Um, and, you know, so that was, you know, later in the 20th century, <laughs> right? But those ideas are still, you know, are, are, were already there and still, uh, you know, and still pertained, right? Um, and, and so I think using those two young women, uh, you know, it's clear, they're clearly foils, right, for Madeline. Clearly, we are to see that Madeline is not the same, right, as these other two young women. Um, but it's, it's working in the same way. It's showing what are the differences between, you know, 
Horace that we see and uh, other young man that we don't, right? What are we, uh, because he's in jail, right? What are we, um, uh, what are we seeing in these two kind of flighty young women who, uh, you know, just kind of float in and out uh, or dash in and out? Um, you know, what, what are we supposed to glean as the distinction, right, between those two characters and Madeline, who obviously we get to know uh, much better in the, the course of the play. So, and it sort of resonates around gender issues. It resonates obviously along this idea of, you know, what is education for? What should our young people be getting out of education? Um, and uh, uh, so I think it works in kind of the same, you know, kind of the same way. Before I ask you about Madeline, who is an incredible character, I want to ask you about another amazing character in this play, which is Grandmother Morton. And just calling her grandmother indicates that she is sending this line way, way back. She was someone's daughter. She's someone's mother. She's someone's grandmother, great grandmother, all that going on. What an amazing character. Um, what are your thoughts on her? When you think about Grandmother Morton, what do you think about? You know, she's a pioneer woman. Um, and of course, Glassbow grew up in uh, Davenport, Iowa. Um, uh, the heart of sort of the Midwest. Um, but at that time, you know, in the uh, sort of latter part of the 19th century, Glass was born in 1876. Iowa is still kind of, you know, frontier territory. I mean, you know, yes, there is the West beyond, but certainly within Glaspell's family, um, there is that kind of frontier mentality. There is that frontier heritage. Her family came and settled, um, you know, in that in that region. So my sense is that that Glaspell would have been aware of uh, that kind of Midwestern pioneer strong, independent, no nonsense uh, women, right? Um, from uh, the not too distant past um, that that really helped make that Midwestern uh, uh, territory what it became, right? Um, and uh, I, I don't think that there's necessarily a particular person on whom grandmother morton you know is is modeled i mean there might there might be but you know we certainly don't know that definitively but i think she uh, uh much in the same way that these other characters are sort of we might want to think of them as composites or as you know representing certain types uh not stereotypes but types um i think grandmother morton is kind of the embodiment of uh the pioneer woman um, um, not the same as the one who we see on the Food Channel. Not that pioneer. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I could get my own cookies. Uh, I love that line. Um, Grandmother Morton talks very balanced, realistically, pragmatically about the relationship between white colonists and the indigenous peoples of North America. And it's heartbreaking to read what she says. Um, is, is this unusual for uh, plays at the time to have this sort of version of indigenous Americans that are presented on the stage? Yeah, oh no, absolutely. Um, you know, uh... It wasn't too much, you know, before that, that we had, uh, you know, plays like Metamora, right? The, the melodramas with the, uh, you know, absolutely stereotypical representations of either the, you know, the noble warrior Indian or the, you know, perhaps violent, you know, whatever. And it, you know, was completely bifurcated, completely stereotypical, um, really no uh, attempt uh, any kind of nuanced uh, representation or or dealing with, as you say, sort of reality, right? Um, so I think it really is quite uh, unusual uh, to have it. And of course, remember too that that she is, you know, we were talking about the Hindus uh, earlier, th that the other thing that I find just remarkable, right, is that Glaspell is picking up on uh, the potential, right, resonances that she can create between the uh, Native American Indians and the Southeast Asian 
Indians, right, and kind of Indians writ large then uh, take on um, uh, some very interesting, as I said, kind of metaphoric nuanced um, uh, resonances, right? Um, so those, uh, the, that notion of othering that we were talking about earlier, you know, just continues to uh, have circle upon circle upon circle, right, across the entire fabric of the, of the play. And of course, Silas, um, her son, Silas Morton, right, mm -hmm also has this incredible relationship that he talks about, right? Um, with uh, um, uh, this just remarkable articulation of the concept of, of empathy, right? Uh, of, of really wanting to understand what it is like to be the other person, right? Um, and, and I think that that's just one of the most profound um, just moments, right, in this play. I mean, we talked about the incarceration <laughs> moment, but that that early section where he talks about uh, wanting to understand, he knows that, you know, he is not obviously a Native American, but wanting that degree of understanding, of connection, of, uh, uh, of, 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 of just uh, um, being uh, uh, as close to another person and understanding that person as possible, um, and then choosing to at make choices and, and take action as a result of that, right? And it's a very complex thing. He feels guilt over uh, the relationship between the white settlers and the Native Americans. Um, in certain ways, the choices that he makes, um, I think he feels like he's uh, making restitution uh, in, a, in a certain way. Um, uh, obviously, he also is very aware of uh, uh, the connections between uh, what he is feeling about the Native Americans and the issues of the immigrants, right? And of course, his friend, right, uh, uh, F uh, Felix, uh, you know, these um, connections, the, the, the one of the remarkable things I think about Inheritors as a play is, is this entire network, right, this fabric, this matrix that Glassville creates, weaving together all of these various plot elements, character elements, thematic elements. Um, it's just the most kind of remarkable uh, series of uh, interrelationships, interpenetrations um, that I can really uh, think of uh, in terms of a you know a piece of American theater. I mean, I just I can't think of very many other plays until we get to something like you know Angels in America, right? That has a certain kind of connective web right, that gets built uh, in, within the world of play. So it really is is quite remarkable in that regard, I think. Silas is an amazing, beautiful character and his speech about going on the top of the hill and sitting on the hill and talking to Black Hawk up there on the hill in those moments of transcendentalism and just, and his grandmother, I think is like, what are you talking about? Felix is like, I have no idea where you're coming from, but I love you, man. And so really, really beautiful stuff. A lot of the things that you just mentioned, the web of inheritors comes together in the beautiful character of Madeline. And just her journey through the play is she, who am I? How do I live up to this reputation that I, that I hear every year spouted about? Uh, my grandfather and what it means to be a Morton and and an, you know one of the Morton colleges you know founding family members and she seems to really struggle with her place in the world until she has that moment at the end when she decides what she's going to do and how she's going to proceed. How do you? How have you, as you've read inheritors, written about inheritors, thought about inheritors? How does Madeline live in your mind? I think you're absolutely right that Madeline is on a, a journey to uh, discover her true self and discover fully what it means to be a Morton and what she believes in. Um, and I think that that journey is is one of, um, in a sense, coming coming back, right? That we have this prologue 
where we get to know Silas, we get to know uh, his best friend Felix. Uh, we hear, you know, a, a lot of this backdrop of what um, what America means, right, in this immediate uh, post Civil War moment, right? Um, that of course is also part of this backdrop. Uh, you know, it's not really a, a, a piece. Um, that gets into issues of slavery, but it's it resonates because it's just hanging there, right, in the background, in Lincoln, in the invocation of Lincoln. Um, uh, so in certain ways, you know, Madeline is, I think, looking uh, back at that moment um, and seeing what has happened in the discourse of Americanism, in the ideas about what America is, right? Um, and she's seeing things having unraveled. She's seeing things having been warped. Uh, she's seeing thing, she's seeing family members, friends, teachers, uh, classmates um, uh, really straying quite far, right? from these founding principles that ironically she's been told she's supposed to uphold and yet uh, what she actually sees going around going on around her is not at all that right um uh and and so that's you know i think that um she becomes in a sense almost a, a, a synecdoche right mm -hmm. for what glasswell has seen going on in america writ large right so madeline becomes the uh uh representative if you will for everything that it has to be questioned uh, about what uh what has what has happened in america uh really in the uh you know lead up to the first world war during the first world war and in the aftermath of that and of course that also includes includes the waves of immigration uh, and anti-immigration legislation that was happening at that time, um, as well as uh, the issues with Native Americans, the uh, issues with uh, formerly enslaved peoples, et cetera, right? So all of that is the backdrop uh, that then we see this one uh, young woman having to, to grapple with, come to grips with, um, and make some very uh, uh, profound choices uh, in terms of her own, you know, her own future. I, we're, we've got a little bit of time left. I want to talk a little bit about a couple of things, particularly um, Madeline's the police brutality and systemic racism against people of color is something that is clearly one of the major plot points of Inheritors. And yeah. Madeline standing up to the police and physically assaulting them twice and she says the second time it came down on the baton um and i know that that was a thing is is has that been it seems so nowadays such a crucial part of the story did that jump out to you when you first encountered inheritors or is just part of our current context that that it really comes to the fore for me I think that we, uh, I think we are seeing it anew, right, in, in this moment. It's not that it, you know, wasn't, it wasn't there. You know, I think that uh, one of the things that is just so amazing about this play is it keeps speaking to us, right? Um, and so things jump out at us at various, you know, at various moments in various ways, right? Um, whether it's the gender issues, the race issues, the class issues, uh, um, political ideology, issues you know they are all there and uh where they sort of are you know uh where they are in a scale uh of things might you know might be shifting a little but absolutely the uh the sense that uh this uh again unseen uh right un unseen uh power right the the you know power structure the uh the police as a, a force that simply hangs over this that we don't see but that is obviously impacting right what's going on um she uses it again right with with that that those kinds of power structures um don't have to be represented we simply feel them nonetheless right so uh you know madeline's uh you know in a weird way you know there's a certain kind of humor right to just whacking the policeman with the tennis racket but of course uh um 
there are very serious consequences for this, right? And she comes to uh, perhaps doesn't in the moment realize how serious those consequences are going to be. That's something that she really um, has to uh, learn and think about. You know, she's given the opportunity to uh, apologize and say it was just a mistake and she chooses not to go there. She chooses to really understand how her own actions, uh, even if they were not as calculated right at the moment as we might uh, imagine they could be safe for her friend in jail, uh, nevertheless, she, she decides to uh, embrace their full ramifications, their full significance. Um, and I think that's a really interesting part of this as well. So amazing in the play when her uncle is like, yeah, I got you out of jail. And she's like, wow, the person that I was defending, he must be really be in a bad spot. He's like, yeah, he's still in jail. You can't just walk into jail and get somebody out of jail. He's like, well, you did that for me. Well, that's a different thing. And she has another line. She's like, I walked out of jail and I saw your bank across the street. And so all those such beautiful, beautiful characterizations. The last little thing I wanted to thank you so much for taking some time. But I think, as you said, different things pop out of this play at different times. And one of the, the things for me as I was reading it is like, what's the twist? What, how did Madeline's mom pass away? What's the big secret? And the secret is she put herself on the front line unthinkingly to go expose herself to a deadly disease and then died from that disease. And reading it now, as we're coming in this phase of the pandemic yes. from, and Glassbell's audience had just lived through a deadly, deadly pandemic at that time, hearing that this character put themselves in the, in the room with a disease must have been extremely powerful and distressing for those audience members. Can you talk a little bit about what that might have meant for Glassbell when she was approaching choosing how Madeline's mother passed away? Yeah, and of course, you know, she doesn't choose the flu, right? right. We, you know, she doesn't choose the Spanish flu. She doesn't go with the 1918-19, you know, pandemic. Um, she chooses diphtheria. Um, which is, of course, you know, also a very deadly kind of infection that certainly was still, uh, uh, you know, going to have um, uh, a resonance. Um, again, historically, I don't know, or biographically, um, I don't know if that uh, struck close to home in some way. Um, uh, I don't know if there were, you know, individuals in her family or that she knew well, you know, that she was modeling um, uh, in this in this regard. Um, but certainly, as you point out, you know, whether we're whether whether that becomes, uh, uh, you know, a, a substitute, if you will, for the flu, or whether, uh, you know, it's it's diphtheria in its own right. Um, you know that that sense of being selfless, of of wanting to help others and putting others' needs first, right? Um, you know, is something that again is part of that fabric. It just resonates right across. Um, but I absolutely agree that uh, while it's you know a, a relatively smaller plot point, um, you know, it's something that in our moment right now absolutely rises to the you know to the fore and and i think is going to really um hit home right for for whether they have whether you know people who uh uh go to your reading or attend your reading uh have a close connection or not they're going to see that as absolutely relevant and resonant yeah the just the the seemingly on, there's nothing you can do uh, for a, a disease. Like you can't fight against it unless you have a vaccine. It's just so mindless, this mindless creature and animal that takes life from you. And I can't imagine what it was like to be in a theater packed full of survivors from World War I and the Spanish flu pandemic. And then to hear someone say, oh, my mom died because of that. And just the, the heart wrenching that Glassbell must have been like, <laughs> 
take this audience. Um, it must have been really, really. Uh, thank you so much for taking some time to talk about this amazingly beautiful play. We could keep on talking about it, as you know. We for didn't hours. Even, we didn't even talk about the three Felixes. Why choose that same name over and over again? What that means for for uh, the the characters, the structure, the web, um, the Emil the, or the ants, all of the different female characters that are in there, the world, the hill, the anyway. There's so much to talk about in there. I encourage everyone to go read Inheritors if you haven't read it. Thank you so much for taking some time. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you for inviting me. I love talking about Glasspool's work. Happy to anytime. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to stop recording.